Well, good morning to all of you and a, and a happy new year. It's 2021, finally. <laughs> you know, as, as I watched some of the, of the New Year's uh, programming on television over the last few days, um, you know, the events that, uh, uh, that bring in the new year as well as some of the year in review programs. And as I've talked to individuals over the last few weeks, there's, there's one theme that seems to keep popping up and that everyone seems to be in agreement about, and that is that 2020 was an awful year and that they can't wait to put it in the rearview mirror and move on. Nobody's missing 2020, right? Would you, would you agree? Certainly been a challenging year, hasn't it? Of course, we don't know what 2021 holds, um, but isn't it good to know that we know someone who does? In fact, our God not only knows the future, but he actually is in sovereign control of the future. Isn't that good to know? And that's why as believers, we can face this new year with peace and hope. God's people are to be people of hope. And if, if ever there was a time when our world needed hope, it's now. So we have an opportunity as we begin this new year, an opportunity to be proclaimers of hope. You know, this, this, this book talks a lot about hope, and it shows us how we can find hope. Do you have hope this morning? You know, if you read the Bible, um, you're going to see that hope is an attribute that should be characteristic of every believer in Christ. It's one of that... Uh, trio that the Bible mentioned various times, faith, hope, and love. And there's no doubt that many people these days live without much hope. They don't really believe that their lives and their circumstances are going to improve in any significant way. They need hope. Not, not just a pep talk or you know some positive thinking or something. They need something to anchor their lives on that's unchanging, that's trustworthy, that gives hope. We all need that. And so I want to begin this new year uh, sharing with you a message of hope. Really, we could turn to so many places in the Bible and find a message of hope. But this morning, I want to invite you to turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke 2. Of course, the first part of this chapter is familiar uh, to us because it recounts the story of the birth of Jesus that we just celebrated Christmas. But you may not be quite as familiar with what follows in the next uh, verses here. So we're going um, to pick up the story where we generally leave off when we read the Christmas uh, story, which is with verse 20. So I invite you to follow along as I start at verse 21 and read up through verse 38. Luke 2, 21 to 38. Here's what Luke recounts for us. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. And when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. So, So what's happening here in this passage? Well, After the the birth of Jesus, which is recounted here in the previous uh, verses, Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem to present him to the Lord and to offer the sacrifices that the Jewish law required. That was something that every Jewish couple did with their baby son 
after his birth. <clears throat> so Mary and Joseph are at the temple in Jerusalem, carrying the newborn baby Jesus in their arms. But while they're there, they encounter two very special people. The first is a man named Simeon, and the second is a woman named Anna. We don't really know very much about either one of them. The truth is that this is the only time that they're mentioned in all of Scripture. You know, it's kind of, kind of like the wise men. They appear on the scene for a few verses, and then they're, they're never mentioned again. They're both, um, uh, well, senior adults, as we would call them today. Uh, but I'm fascinated by their story because they were obviously people who had a deep relationship with God and people who lived with a surprising amount of faith and hope in the midst of a time and a situation where most would have argued that there was not much reason for hope. You know, so sometimes it can happen that as people get older, they can become a little more negative, a little more pessimistic. Do you know anybody like that? You know, they get kind of <clears throat> nostalgic about how great things used to be, and they're always complaining about how the whole world's going down the tubes and that sort of thing. But although Simeon and Anna were, were getting along in years, I, I don't see them joining in that chorus. You know, they, they were really pretty hopeful, upbeat kind of people. We're often tempted, no matter what our age, to look back with nostalgia on times when it, it seems to us, at least, things were better. And it's true that we live in difficult times, don't we? Not, not very hopeful times in many ways. In fact, several surveys have shown that a significant number of people think that the next generation, in other words, their children, will have things harder and not easier, economically and in other ways as well. So hope seems to be in short supply these days. But as we said a moment ago, as, as children of God, we can face the future with hope. We have many reasons to have hope. Now, let me remind you, as we've mentioned on other occasions, that the Bible uses the word hope very differently than we tend to use it. We most often use the word hope as a kind of a synonym of wish. You know, like, I hope I get a BMW for Christmas. <laughs> that means that's my desire, my wish. I want one, but honestly, I'm not at all sure I'll get one. In fact, in this case, I'm pretty sure I won't. <laughs> but you see, the, the way we use the word hope leaves a lot up in the air, kind of even leaves things more doubtful than sure. You know, I, I wish it would happen, but I hope so, but I don't know, you know. The Bible, however, uses the word hope very differently. The, their hope refers to a confident anticipation of that which we know and are sure will happen, but just hasn't happened yet. That which we anticipate with certainty, with, with confidence, with assurance. And you can see how that uh, is different than how we tend to use the, the word. Uh, very different than just kind of wishing. And, and Simeon and Anna had that biblical kind of hope. They had that confidence and assurance. But why? So that's what I want us to think about some this morning. Why, how could they live with such hope? What was their secret? Well, I think that there are some reasons why they were hopeful, and they're really the same reasons why I think we can have hope as we begin this new year. In the first place, Simeon and Anna were hopeful and confident because they understood that God is still at work in His world, that He is still active, that He is active on my behalf and in my life and situation and in yours. I want to remind you that this encounter with Jesus in the temple came after 400 years of essentially silence. You know, between the Old Testament and the New Testament in your Bible, there's, there's most likely just one thin sheet of paper. But that one page represents 400 years between the close of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. 400 years in which God did not speak to His people. I mean, there were, there were no prophets, there were no... There was no word from God, no angels appeared, just silence. I mean, the Jews still carried on their religious rites and ceremonies, and they prayed to God, but God didn't seem to, to say anything back as he had before. Just, just silence for, for four centuries. And it would have been easy to have come to the conclusion that God had abandoned his people. But you see, th this encounter in the temple changed everything, because here was Exhibit A, if you will, that God had not abandoned his people. On the contrary, that he was involved and active in a whole new way in his world, in his creation, in a way like never before, taking on the form of a man and, and living among us. And Simeon and Anna don't seem to have been greatly surprised at that. They lived, you see, with this confident hope. The Bible describes them as being among those who were waiting for the consolation of Israel. 
as they had hope, a biblical kind of hope, an assurance that God would not abandon His people and that He would send His Messiah. You know, some may have said to them, but hey, 400 years we've been waiting. No, God, God doesn't work that way anymore. It's not like in the old days. It doesn't happen that way anymore. Do you ever think that? I mean, as you read the, the stories in, in the Bible, isn't it tempting to say, well, that's nice, but God, do, God doesn't do that anymore. He doesn't work that way anymore. And Simeon and Anna would have said, sure he does. God is still at work. Listen, that's a game changer. I, I mean, I want to tell you today, as we begin another year over 2,000 years later, that God is still at work. He has not abandoned you. And I trust that you see evidence of of that in your own life, of His working. Perhaps you've had moments when you've doubted, perhaps even now, that you felt like God has abandoned you, that He doesn't hear you, that He doesn't help you, that He's just, that there's just silence. But I tell you, God has not abandoned you. Have hope. And the greatest evidence of His interest in your life and the problems that you're facing is the Incarnation, is Christmas. Why do I say that? Because it shows us that God doesn't just show interest from afar, but that He has actually entered our world, that He actually became a man and walked in our shoes, so to speak. And and now He's given us His Holy Spirit to live in us and be His presence with us in every moment and in every situation. I will not leave you orphans, Jesus said, but I will come to you. In, in the person of the Holy Spirit. And he gave, us, he gave us many other promises as well. Hebrews 13, 5. I will never leave you or forsake you. Matthew 28, uh, 20. Surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Philippians 1, 6. I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And, and I could mention many other similar promises that show us God's commitment to always be with us, always involved in our lives, always working, forming us into mature disciples, holy and useful in the service. So I have hope, my dear brothers and sisters. Your God is great. Your God is good. Your God loves you. And that is the God who is at work in your life. You may say to me, but but why doesn't he listen to me? Why doesn't he speak? Why doesn't he answer me? (laughs) Could it be that God wants to ask you the same question? Why don't you listen to me? Why don't you talk to me? Why don't you answer me? Listen, I, I know that sometimes we go through difficult times when we don't feel God's presence, perhaps. But I want to give you a word of encouragement and hope this morning. God is at work in your life and in your situation, if you will allow Him to be. Simeon and Anna clearly saw the evidence of that in that baby in the arms of Mary. Can you imagine the emotion that Simeon and Anna felt when they saw that baby, the Messiah, the promised one. And when they realized what it meant, that God had not abandoned His people, but that instead He was putting in motion a plan like no other plan that would bring hope, hope to the whole world. But I see here in this passage other reasons to be hopeful as we begin this year, 2021. We can also have confidence and hope because we see, like like Simeon and, and Anna, that God keeps His promises. Many, many years before, God had promised His people that He would send a Messiah, a Savior. Many years went by, centuries. Would God keep His promise? Doubtless there were those who began to doubt that. Others said, well, if God wasn't going to send them the Messiah to free them from their oppressors, then they'd have to do it themselves. (laughs) But Simeon and Anna, and and others too, this, this passage tells us, lived by faith, trusting that God was going to do what He had promised. Every day they waited for the fulfillment of the promise, for the coming of the Messiah. So for them it was not a question of if He was going to come, but when He was going to come. And one glorious day He came. Can you imagine how Simeon and Anna must have felt? Their hope was vindicated and God was shown to be trustworthy and faithful. God kept His promise and He still keeps His promises. He will love you. He will protect you. He will provide for you. He will forgive you. He will give you peace. He will do all of these things and many more. How do I know that? Because He has promised to do it. And God always keeps His promises. The Bible is full of promises. And you know what? God is going to keep every one of those promises. Not a single one will be left undone, unfulfilled. And that's why when we talk about biblical hope, we're talking about something certain, something sure. Because God is faithful, and what He says, He'll do. So we can have hope, 
because God is at work in the world and in our lives, and we can have hope because what he promises he will do. And finally, as believers, we can have the hope and confidence that Christ is coming back again. This is one of the great themes of the Bible, and it is, in fact, one of those promises of which we've been speaking. Jesus said that he's coming back. He left no doubt about that. It is the sure hope of every believer. As we've seen, Simeon and Anna lived with hope. The hope and confidence that God would fulfill his promise and send the Messiah. And they were blessed to see the fulfillment of that promise in the temple that day when they, when they held that baby in their arms. Jesus, the promised one. But God has made another promise. He has promised that Christ will come again a second time. Simeon and Anna were waiting for his first advent, his first coming. We await his second coming. But Simeon and Anna are really kind of an example to us of how to wait. Like them, we should live with this hope, this anticipation, this confidence and assurance that God is going to fulfill his promise and that one day soon, Jesus will come again. I want to ask you, are you living in that hope? Are you like Simeon and Anna eagerly awaiting his arrival? You know, New Year's tends to be a time when we look back at the past and, and forward to the future. I, I kind of think of it almost like a seam in time. You know, a seam is a place where two pieces of cloth are joined and sewn together. And New Year's is kind of like that. It's that seam in time between two years where, where one year is joined to the next, if you will. But we also live in another seam in time. We live in a, in a time that the theologians call the church age, which is a term that they use to describe the time between the first coming of Christ and his second coming. At Christmas, we look back to his first coming, his birth, the, the first advent. But this is also a good moment to look forward to his second coming. In the book of Revelation, the Lord makes this declaration. He says, surely I come quickly. Can you respond to the, as the church does in that passage and says, Amen, come quickly, Lord Jesus. The new year can be a good time to celebrate what God has done in the past year, but we can also look forward to what God is going to do and wants to do in our lives and in this church in the year 2021 or until he comes. There's lots to do. And, and I want to challenge you to be like Simeon and Anna, eagerly awaiting the coming of the Lord, but at the same time, dedicated to his service and prayer, doing his work and preparing the way for the Lord. Maybe the Lord will come back this year, 2021. That's what the Apostle Paul calls the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, his second coming. Is, is that your hope? Or are you kind of hoping that he doesn't come back yet because you aren't ready? Today would be a good time to make sure that you are ready. When I look at this world, when, when I look at our own society and our own community and all that's going on in this time, I, I see a desperate need for hope. People are living without hope because they're living without Christ. Maybe you need hope this morning. God can give you that hope. He's at work in this world and He wants to work in your life as well. Won't you let Him? You can have that hope because what God says, He will do. He always keeps His promise. And someday, maybe today, He's coming back. Are you ready? How are you facing this new year? With hope? I am. In fact, I'm, I'm really excited about what I believe God has in store for us this year. I can't wait to get started. But I want you to notice something. This, this hope that we have all comes back to that baby who was born that first Christmas. That, that's what gave Simeon and Anna hope. And now, 2,000 years later, it is still true that the only true hope we have is found in Jesus. So he must be at the center of our plans, our hopes, our dreams, our lives. Let me close this morning with this word from the Lord to his people, taken from Jeremiah chapter 29. Receive this as, as from the Lord to you, what he wants to say to you. He says to you, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you'll call on me and come and pray to me and I'll listen to you. And you'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart, and I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious God, how we 
need your hope in these difficult days. And we thank you for the hope that is found in you, that you never stop working, that you never give up on us, that you keep your promises, and that we can look forward to the day of your soon return. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And until that day, help us to live in hope according to your promises, that we might see you at work in our lives and in our circumstances. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. May God bless you in this new year.